Hi, Pastor Larry Rogers here with our online program, New Horizons Church in Kelso, Washington. So glad that you could join us for another program. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the top 10 scriptures that are Googled. People all over the world use the internet to search for scriptures. I think it'd be interesting to see what the top 10 scriptures are. Now, December 1st, 2021, uh, it says year in review and an article by Jonathan Peterson, the content manager for Bible Gateway, which goes through Google. It's a search engine for Christian scriptures. Listen to this. With nearly 3 million searches per day, the article reads, more than 2,000 per minute around the clock being generated by tens of millions of people in more than 200 countries. It'd be interesting to see what, what are people looking for? And let's speculate together, why do you think those are there? All right, here we go. In about the next 20 to 21 minutes, we want to just take a minute on each scripture and talk about it, the top 10 starting from number 10. But wait, let's go 11, let's do an honorable mention. So outside the top 10, here was number 11. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. That's Matthew 6, 33. So it's talking about in that scripture, putting God first. Now, a lot of people serve God this way, somewhere in the middle. Uh, I don't mean to put God last. And when you serve God that way, God never comes first. It has to be intentional. Faith is making the effort to put God first even because of the weakness of our flesh, maybe he ends up at number three at times. Okay, well, it'd be better if he was number one. But the effort of faith to put God first is very, very important in the life of a believer. God gives us spiritual desire. And because of that, we read God's word, we pray, we go to church, we do what Christians do. We do what people do that have the spirit of God in them. Do you have the spirit of God in you? Do you have any desire for God? Well, when you do, the Bible says it comes from God. Only the Spirit of God can draw a person to God. It's not a matter of human personality or will. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And here's the promise. And all things will be given to you as well. So there it is, honorable mention. Now we move into number 10, Isaiah 41, 10. And it reads like this. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Hey, that's a good one right now, isn't it? I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I think that righteous right hand refers to what God does openly, powerfully. Well, like the Exodus. It was right out there. God took the people of Israel right out of Egypt, took them, you know, through the waters, and they passed by on dry ground supernaturally, and they went to the other side, and they were delivered. It's a picture of deliverance. It's a picture of the power of God. Did you know that God can take habits out of your life? Did you know that God can separate you from your past? Did you know that God has a plan to help you? It shouldn't surprise you. He's not hiding from you. He wants to help you. And when you put your trust in him, 4110 of Isaiah in the Old Testament, do not fear. In other words, don't have a phobia. Don't be afraid. For I am with you. God's personal presence is with us. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ as God's son, and you've accepted him as Savior, the indwelling Holy Spirit lives in you. That's God's presence. That is the difference maker. And so why would people look up the scripture? I think that people would want to know that we can be strengthened, that we don't have to live in fear in the middle of a pandemic, that God's personal presence is with us. And he says, I will help you. I will uphold you. So he's not somebody out there that's sterile in the cosmos somewhere. God is living and active in our lives. That's a good thing to know. That's number nine. 
We roll now into number eight. And uh, excuse me, that's number 10. We'll move, move into number nine. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who, can, who strengthens me. Another version says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. So God is a God who gives us strength. He's a God who helps us. What do you mean? Is that a metaphor? He strengthens me? I mean, are my muscles going to get bigger? No, we're talking about spiritually now. We're talking about emotionally. We're talking about internally. When the Spirit of God lives in us, He empowers us to think differently and act differently. Therefore, things on the outside world go differently because when you think different, you act different, things are going to go different. We can't do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? So at number nine, a reminder, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Who's him? Jesus Christ, our Lord, the person of Jesus. Now at number eight, by the way, in these three million uh, that are Google each day in the top 10, I want to tell you this. I'm going to give you a Psalm 23 alert. Three of the verses in Psalm 23, in chapter 23 of Psalms, three of them are in the top eight. Here's number eight. It says, Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And so here it's talking about God preparing things for you. What kind of table? A table of his provision. God can provide for you divinely. Bible story. Old Testament. The children of Israel are going through the land and they're out in the desert and it's raining quail and it's raining manna that they pick up and they eat it. Water comes out of a rock. There's so many people in that desert and there's no food source, but God was their food source supernaturally. Let's just say this, with supply chains being broken, with uh, times that we live in, uh, with uh, cataclysmic economic uh, policies and situations that are breaking America, we're going to have to go back Let's say many people will have to go back to really relying on God. Now, I don't want to make you afraid, but what about medicines? What about a break in the supply chain if there's no medicine? We're going to need God to help us in a way maybe we haven't before, and He will be there for us. He sets a table. He provides for us. He said, in the presence of my enemies, there are people that are going to be against you in your lifetime. I know it's hard to take, but... There's just might be somebody that just doesn't know how lovable and wonderful and how great you are. And they may not think that way. I know it's hard to buy into, but that can happen. But we know at a deeper level, there's a spiritual enemy that would want to plot and scheme against us. We don't see him, but he's there. And our God is a defense. He anoints my head with oil, the oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, our head, where our thoughts are. And so anointing with the Holy Spirit is God's breaking of the wrong thinking, and it's a protection of the things in our mind and in our lives that flow out of our mind. My cup runs over. In other words, our life can run over with the power, strength, and love catch this, and the presence of God, the real presence of God. Sometimes you feel him, sometimes you don't. But his real presence, interacting back and forth, you with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit with you, and that communication back and forth creates strength and confidence and real power in your life. That's number eight. Now at number seven, Philippians 4, 6. Do you think you know that one? It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Let me say it another way. There's more that you can do than pray in your life. 
but we should pray first. Prayer should be one of the first things. Prayer is not talking God into what you want him to do. It's coming in agreement with him about his will and his plan and his provision in your life. And so we don't want to spend our life trying to talk God into doing something he doesn't want to do. That won't work. But it says, don't be anxious. Okay, I think there's a lot of anxiousness going on. I know I've felt some. How about you? Another word for it? Don't be stressed out. Don't be dominated by stress about any kind of stress. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, in other words, God cares what you're going through. Share your life with God. Larry, I don't know how to pray. Share your life with God. Share your burden. Share your concerns. Talk to him with the confidence that you're talking to a friend. Okay, here's another related thing. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, praying for you. The Holy Spirit that fills you is that Holy Spirit that would cause you to pray the right prayers and think God thoughts when you wouldn't be able to. It's a supernatural edge on the enemy. It's a supernatural touch on your life. Remember, if God is for me, who can be against me? All right, I'm preaching now. I'm going into full, but full mode now, but now we got to go to number six. The second Psalm reference is 23.6. Why do you think this is in here? Surely goodness and love, another version says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely your goodness. Okay, God is good. Aren't you glad he's not mean? Aren't you glad he's not mad all the time? Wouldn't it be terrible if God was evil? He's God. He's at the top of the food chain. What are you going to do? There's nothing you can do. But he's not mean. He's not evil. He's full of good intentions. Goodness is healthy. Good food, good water, uh, good friends. Health brings health to us. God is a good God. Ask him to be part of your life. Goodness will come into your life. Evil won't come into your life. It'll be more healthy. I'll throw it in. I'll just throw it in for free. You will holistically be better. You will be more of a whole person with God. And so surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. There's a prediction you want to have about your life. Hey, I want to tell you something about your life. Love's going to fill your life, and it's going to follow you all the days of your life. Love's going to be a part of your life. Hey, I'd like that kind of fortune cookie if it were for real. Love is God coming in. Good intentions and good things happening. Okay, the last part. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, I watched a slideshow. Loved it on YouTube. There's several slideshows you can look up. And it's this very old slides. Like, let's say it's... Uh, before 1900. So, you know, they're wearing the swimsuit that looks like a prison outfit on the beach. Okay, I mean, you know, really old school. And I got a kick out of that. But here's the thing I noticed with all the neat old slides. I thought everybody in this slideshow, there's nobody left on the earth. Every person is absolutely gone. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. At the end of your life, whenever it is, some people leave this world in the middle of their life. Tragically, I've seen it as a pastor. Some people live, you know, not that long for whatever reason. It plays with your mind. What do you do about that? I don't know what to say. Accidents happen. But I will say this. Whenever you leave this life, it's good to absolutely know that in the next life, you have a good life, an eternal life with God. And everybody can have that by receiving Jesus. Jesus, uh, forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of my mistakes. I believe you're God's son. Come into my life and make a place for me in your kingdom. I receive you as my savior in Jesus' name. So a prayer like that, God's not caught up in every thee and thou and every little word, but a prayer like that can change your life and the Spirit of God can come in, and the Spirit of God can live in you, and right then you have eternal life. Pray that prayer or a prayer like it. Receive Jesus. 
I've never been sorry. I know that. I've never looked back. It's, it's just a good way to go. All right, we're moving along to number five. We're going to move a little faster here. Here's a classic, Romans 12.2, that was Googled. So all these millions of people, here's the one. We're getting into the real popular top five now. It said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. In other words, change, transform from the inside out. God's not interested in making you boring, dull, and religious. He's interested in changing your thoughts, changing your life, and letting His Spirit and His energy and His Holy Spirit live in you so that you can love God supernaturally and have a relationship with Him here and in eternity. And so it says, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So God's will in your life is that you know Him. God's will is that you know what He's thinking. Okay, when you read the Bible, you know what He's thinking. So anywhere you want to read, uh, you know, you can read that and you know what God's thinking. That is a powerful thing. Number four, Psalm 23, 4. Here's the third of the three Psalms making the top eight. Even though I walk through the darkest valley... I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So I've sat on the Mount of Olives looking down where you look down in that golden dome, and right there is that valley, and right there would be a dangerous place because the cliffs were very high, and then there was the walls of the city, and when you walk there, there could be uh, robbers in the shadows. Perfect place to ambush you because you couldn't run to the right. You couldn't run to the left. You could only go backwards. And so in this context, we just look and see this. Even though I walk in the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Now try to think spiritually. We just gave a physical picture. In other words, even though when you die, there's darkness. Jesus will meet you the moment you die. And you will be taken into paradise to meet Jesus. And that dark place will be a light place. You have nothing to fear when you die if you have Jesus. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Again, a promise of God's personal presence in your life. Listen to the last part. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff talk about the authority of God. God has the authority to forgive sins. God has the authority to put you in heaven. God has the authority the same as a shepherd would carry a rod and a staff. That's comforting to know that God is a control in a mixed up, messed up, well, sometimes upside down world. How about that? We move to number three now for the sake of time. Romans 8.28 reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. So it doesn't mean that everything happens for a reason in the sense that, you know, um, it makes it good. But sometimes, even when bad things happen, God is using these things. It says, and we know that in, it doesn't say sometimes, it says in all things. God works for the good of those who love Him. So, believer, you may be going through some things, and you may not understand why. From diseases, financial reversal, sometimes it's political policy. Sometimes it's decisions we make. Other times, it's beyond that. You don't know why it's happening to you. And God promises somehow He will use that for an overall good, not that it's good of itself. Even what happens for evil will somehow be used in an overall context for good. That's a mind bender for me, but that's a powerful thought. So let me share a scripture briefly. Old Testament, the story of Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. That was a bad thing. But in the end, he quoted Genesis 50, 20, written there to his brothers as he was sold into slavery, went into Egypt. 
He later became the head of the whole food supply during a famine, and he supplied the food for the brothers and the dad to live. And so they lived. A bad thing was he got sold into slavery. The good thing is God raised him up and God used it to preserve the lives of the family. Here's the guy in the only place that has food in the whole world, Egypt, and he's the head of it all. He somehow took a bad thing, he turned it around, and it was used for an overall good. The story of Joseph. Joseph said, but as for you, he said to the brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is today to save much people alive. In other words, to preserve the 12 tribes of Israel, his brothers, and knowing that the offspring, the Messiah, would come, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so God did a great thing, even in the midst of a negative thing. Now we're at number two. I think I know why this one is here. I think it's an easy one. Let me read it to you and see what you think. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. This is God talking through a prophet who gave a lot of bad news. They called him the weeping prophet. But this isn't a weeping prophecy. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Why do you think that's there? I think people want to know that they have hope. They want to know that they have a future. And they want to know that God is for them, not against them. And so there it is. God has a plan for your life. It's a good plan. So let's just break it down to a real simple form. Would you rather go to a place that has streets of gold, crystal river, there's no more dying, there's no more lying, there's no more pain, and, you know, it's, it's the best place that ever would be, heaven. Or would you rather go to hell, a place of evil, of eternal darkness, misery, suffering, torment? Okay, that's a bad plan. Don't go there. You don't need to. Receive Jesus. So I believe this is there simply because people want to know there's good ahead, designed by God in their life. What do you think's number one? Here it is. Yeah, it's John 3.16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have a good life. No, that's not what he said. He said, eternal life, that's better. So this is a story, God's story. God loved the world. He had one son, Jesus, Jesus the Christ, and the Messiah, and he gave his one and only son that whoever puts faith in him would have eternal life. Old Testament story real quick here. There was a snake, a serpent on a pole, and... So what happened is the children of Israel were being snake bit. They would, uh, they would get bit by these snakes, and it was a judgment. It was a judgment that brought death. Wait a minute. A snake in a garden. Wouldn't that be the devil? Okay, so, so what happens is they're dying. But when they look to the serpent on a pole, what happens? They're healed instantly. And that's a picture of death becoming life because the Son of God hung on a cross, and whoever looks to Him, puts their trust in Him, will have eternal life. So let me read it last time. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him, that can be you, a whoever, and me, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, these are all real good, aren't they? These are the most Googled scriptures. Thanks for joining me. I want to pray over your life. God, thank you for each one here today. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move in each life. I pray that the power of the written word, the promises of God, we claim them. We pull them into our mind and we pull them close to us. And we put our faith in you, Jesus. We put our faith in you, God. Thank you for eternal life and the eternal word of God, which heals us and helps us and makes us whole. Lord, let my portion be goodness and mercy to follow me 
all the days of my life. And I pray for my friends. I pray that many people would know Jesus and hold on to eternal life and believe fully to salvation and become followers of Jesus. I pray that's your portion, friend. God bless you. Thanks for joining me. I hope to see you again on another program.